And I have found that if I do my miracle morning, so it's about an hour, hour and a half, it's reading. It's not business mm-hmm. stuff. It's getting my mindset right to be positive and happy in my own mind. Then the business becomes a lot easier. And I do it because I love it. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. I'm here today with Adrian Smood, who is usually based in Florida. He is a best-selling author on the topic of mobile homes. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. And also, we just discovered off-camera a fan of property management. So lots of cool stuff to talk about. Adrian, welcome to the show. I appreciate you having me. I'm excited about this episode. Yeah, cool. Uh, So why don't you start by just telling our audience a little bit about your journey through life that's led you to be here talking to me and doing what you do. I'm going to give the shortest version as I can. So I started out as a 20-year-old, actually about 19 years old, really, really terrible tenant. Like you don't want to rent to 20-year-old Adrian and his friends because we had parties like spaghetti wrestling, pudding wrestling, mud wrestling parking a motorcycle in the living room. We got eviction notices for all of these things. I'm a problem solver though at heart. So I bought the house, moved my friends in, which learned, which I learned then that we were really bad tenants and what the landlord had to deal with. But I did something really smart is I divided my mortgage up amongst my friends so that they paid my mortgage and I lived for free. At 20 years old, living for free and not with mom and dad is really, really cool. Well, a few years later, I said, well, could I buy another house? I went to the banks because that's all I knew at that time. The bank said, yeah, you can buy another house, but you're going to lose a little bit every month. Don't worry. Real estate goes straight up. You can refinance in a few years. Well, in a few years, the real estate market was going down, the 08 crash. Well, I went from losing a little bit every month to a little bit more because I had one of those adjustable rate mortgages. And I held thinking that, no, I'm right. It's going to come back. And I sold at the bottom, sold the property as a short sale, lost about 50% of the value of it. So obviously a ding to my credit, a uh, ding to my ego, but the biggest was a ding to my integrity. I didn't do what I said I was going to do and pay those loans back. Fast forward, I ended up getting back into real estate because I didn't lose that first one because I bought it right and I was renting it right. Bought some more houses and then I ended up with in the mobile home niche. So single unit mobile homes with the land. I have transferred my entire business over to those. And we can talk about why, but that is what my business is today and what pays for my lifestyle. Like you mentioned, I'm not in Florida. I built a business that's geographically free so I can be based out of anywhere I want to have internet. Great. <laughs> that's, that's living the dream. Um, it's, it's really funny. Like uh, that's, you have, a, we have a similar sort of a history of how we get in, got into things. And so I want to ask you, you know, because this was like definitely part of my trajectory, like what was it like managing your bunch of crazy friends when you were 20? Because that's like exactly how I got started as a property manager was like at that phase of life where like you don't have a lot of authority yet and you're trying to like get your friends to clean up, be responsible, pay the rent. So what was that like? The cleanup, that was the hardest because I learned – we all had a different level of what clean meant. And I am the cleanest of all my friends, <laughs> which made some difficult, you know, tension at times. So I tried different things. I said, you know what? I'm going to charge a cleanup fee if you don't clean up. So one of my friends said, sweet. I don't have to clean up at all now. I was like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. That's not what I wanted. But we did have to kind of figure some things out. That's what I really learned, though. Everyone's level of what cleanliness is different and it was some tough conversations i mean that that's really it i was making money or breaking even so i was living for free and at the time it was worth it i made a ton of mistakes though especially once it stopped becoming just friends you know friend would move out and then it's like all right well who moves in no one had a friend that needed to move in so then you go to craigslist and you start getting all these crazier people and you're like well i don't know i don't think this is the right person to move in but then you're like, I need money to come in. So I learned a lot of stuff the hard way there. 
And so then tell me, because like I want to get to the mobile home thing, but I because I'm just so fascinated by this, like how that turns into property management. So, you know, is that do you think like it's a character thing? Like what? Because you 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 mentioned off camera before that, like you I guess you self manage properties and you're going to start to build out a team. So like what's that? What was that experience like going from, you know, trying to keep the guys in line to then opening it up to Craigslist and to now like you're managing tenants with whom you have just like a business relationship. So like what was that transition like? It was slowly just learning the right way to do it and not being scared of the lease. I mean, I remember at the beginning, I was so scared for the person to ask me any questions in the lease because I didn't understand it. I probably hadn't even read it in the beginning. I just pushed it over and hoped they didn't ask questions. So then they would ask a question. I'd research it some. I'd be able to explain out what the answer is. And then slowly I'm like, well, I need to understand all this. Then as I started learning more about it, I'm like, I have to understand all this. There's actually laws about this. And really, I think the reason I love it so much now is I do like to do things that most people don't. So I, I've learned a lot of people are bad at property management. And the other reason is I believe management is mainly communication. I think that's where a lot of people fail at it. In communication with our tenants or residents, I call them, and our team, my spouse, my friends, you right now, it's really the same thing. Obviously, we're going to talk a little different. I'm not going to tell my residents I love them like I tell my you know wife, but the the similarities are really similar and i really got into just communication in general and i that's just part of it i think that people mismanage because they don't understand communication and expectations huh really interesting so did you how did you come to that i mean like did you do some kind of like coaching or is it just sort of like life experience taught you that how how did you get those skills how did you come to that conclusion my, I'm pausing here because I've never been asked that. I don't know the exact answer. I'll give you what I think is the answers. Some of my mentors did push very hard that the management is the most important part. Yes, you need to buy the property right, but you can buy the property right and mismanage it and you'll lose money. So I actually listened to these uh, elder senior friends and mentors of mine, You know, the ones that have no hair or their shiny gray hair. Because they're smart. They've been in the business longer than me. So I, I listened to that. And then I did take some courses on the topic of management. And in those courses, I learned they were really teaching psychology and communication. That's actually what one of my mentors, David Tony, uh, he majored, I believe, in psychology. It's like, this makes sense why we are putting phrases, why we're actually explaining the lease, not mm -hmm. just pushing over and saying, push hard and sign. And then getting mad at them because they don't keep it up. I think that's why. And then the communication. Uh, I mean, I, my uh, wife and I had some relationship challenges. Like most relationships do. I dove very deep in. Into the relationship communication part. And realized well, these are the same mistakes. Made across all of my life. And I just started seeing the similarities. It's all across everything. So that's I think why I dove so deep into it. Mm -hmm. And do you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have like a kind of a takeaway? Cause I find that I find, I find what you're saying really fascinating. Like, do you have, if you wanted to share with our audience, like one or two, I don't know, mistakes or one or two kind of strategies, like, can you think of any, you know, aha moments or, or things that, that happened for you that you were like, oh, wow, I should have just started doing that years ago. I think it's the expectations. I really think that's the, one of the biggest pieces. If uh, going back to the least part. If we don't actually explain the lease, well, then how do we expect them to follow it? Because, yes, they're supposed to read before they sign, but we know no one reads anything before they sign. Before you get a new device, you just click accept terms and, and go through. But why is it going to be any different with someone signing a lease? Well, we actually go over the lease. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half on Zoom, and we go over the whole thing. I tell stories of why we have different things in it. That is very similar as any relationship. You and I right here, if you didn't set the expectation, we are going to record this at a certain time. Well, then maybe I would have shown up three hours ago or three hours from now. And then you're like, well, what's going on? Well, you didn't tell me. And the same with, you know, my wife or anything else. If we don't have clear expectations, it's hard to get the other person to 
meet us where we're expecting if we don't vocalize it. I think that's the problem is we don't vocalize. We we do a lot of assuming, and I still get caught up in that today. And I'm like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have assumed that. I should have actually asked a clear question. Yeah, and I think uh, I mean what's like nestled in what you're saying is also like I think we we uh, us human beings like have a tendency to, you know, you assume something, you get disappointed, and then you attribute bad intentions to the person who's sitting across mm. the table from you, and that like that's actually what happens when you're assuming is that it's like the oh man they didn't do it like obviously it's their fault, but no it's like the, like I think you you mentioned it's that's like that's a communication mess up. And if you had set verbally communicated about setting the expectations initially, well, then there's no ne assumptions necessary. So I think you're, I think you're, you're definitely right with that. Yes. Thank you for adding that. That is perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So now I want to hear about mobile homes. So uh, this is a Canadian show. You're speaking to mostly Canadian investors. What do you have to tell us about investing in mobile homes in the U.S.? Yeah. So there mainly are in the U.S. the mobile homes. I want to talk about the three different ways to invest in mobile homes. You can own just the home. So you're going to own an aluminum box. You don't own any dirt. Somebody else owns the dirt and you pay them rent every single month. This is typically in a mobile home park. And then you can own the mobile home park, the whole thing, all the homes, the dirt, everything. There's two main ways to run those. You can own just the dirt and people pay you that lot rent every single month to park it there. And that is typically ran like a parking lot. And then you can own everything, the homes, dirt, absolutely everything. You own a flat apartment complex. Now, these have gotten really popular in the last few years. It got lots of zeros on the purchase price, the syndications, the uh, hedge funds got into it. I like to stay right in the middle of the two of those. One unit with the dirt. So it is a real estate transaction. I own the home and dirt together. It's in a single family space. And it's this forgotten little niche. So if there's forgotten, there's less competition in it. Less competition just means we have to do less work to find them, less money in marketing uh, to find them. And there's some bad stereotypes in them. I mean, we could talk about those if you want. And I want to help curve a little bit of that bad stereotype, but they're stereotypes. You know, they're, they're in all the different asset classes. So that is the basics of the three ways to invest in mobile homes. Okay. So I want to hear about your business model and I want to hear about the... Um, you know, bad stereotypes. When I hear mobile homes in the U.S., I hear, you know, low end. Um, I hear banks don't want to finance them, I think. And I'm assuming you have a difficult tenant population. So maybe you can tell me where I'm right, where I'm wrong, what you do about some of those things to kind of make it an attractive investment. Well, you were really kind with your choice of words, but what you were probably thinking and some of the listeners are thinking are trailer trash. <laughs> that is the thing that everyone thinks about because there's a Netflix special, there's movies that make fun of it, and it's a funny stereotype. But that's not who lives in most of my properties. We buy a good property in a good area and we fix it up to a manner that someone wants to live there, which then that's probably going to attract a good tenant, resident. Now, I could go after the quote-unquote trailer trash right, so I could buy in a bad area, not fix it up at all, and attempt to attract a bad tenant resident. But because I look for someone that wants to live there, our uh, average, I'll say, or a regular tenant that lives there is a blue-collar, handy man, handy woman. That is someone that takes pride in their property. Think of the AC tech the roofer, the carpenter, the painter, and they move in, they want to stay there for a long time. And they value their home, even though I'm not selling it to them, it's still their home and they want to stay there for a really long time. So it is a stereotype. It doesn't have to be true. Just like any home, you can treat it really bad and get lower in quality, troublesome people. We don't do that in our properties. Now, that doesn't mean we only have the blue collar, handy man, handy woman. We have someone that moved in earlier this year, straight out of college, working IT from home, 75K a year. He wanted a quarter acre, three bedroom, two bath property. And the mobile home uh, vice that or satisfied that. You mentioned financing, though. That's the other big one that we always get. At. I'm going to break this in kind of two categories, age ranges. So 1990s and newer. 
you can get financing on those. The home and land together, you can get financing. Mainly you go to uh, credit unions, you go to the uh, small community banks. Those are the best. Uh, they will lend on them. You have to find out the rules for that area. And then you can swing over to the 1960s, 70s, the old ones. There's virtually no financing on them. Technically, those smaller banks can go back to a magic year of June 15th, 1976. That is the year that, not my birthday, it's the year that the federal government, HUD, stepped in and said, hey, we're going to have some type of housing qualification for these mobile homes because before that they were just kind of built however the state you know regulated it so that is a year that the banks will go back to it is hard to get affordably a 1977 up to that standard that they're still gonna finance it so how do we finance those old ones me it's my own cash which obviously runs out pretty quick no matter how much we have and we can use owner financing and private money. And I believe those are two topics that people haven't really needed to learn in the last decade because interest rates have been going down, prices have been going up. It's been easy to use the banks. Now we're in a different market. You know, if you think we're in a recession, you think we're going to be in one one day, you think the government's going to, sorry, our government's going to keep changing the terms of it recession i don't think your government's doing that it's just the u.s um but with that happening the banks have already tightened i think they're going to continue tightening not just in the mobile home space and all spaces so those two topics i believe are huge if you're not already learning them to learn them to make it through the next recession so that's how we buy most of them owner financing and private money mm -hmm. uh, and so what's the just out of curiosity what's the typical price tag Let's go back to those older ones because there are two different buckets here. Is the 60s, 70s, I can buy those and be all in around the $35,000 to $50,000 range. You know, it's going to change a little bit depending on what the dirt is worth because there is some value there, especially in the older ones. I can rent those, we'll just say for $1,100 a month. You know, that's in my market in the central Florida area. So you don't need a calculator to say that those are good numbers. Those are great numbers. Yes, they are. <laughs> now you get the newer ones, the 1990s and newer. And by the way, the 80s, they're just kind of a transition decade. So it's got a little bit of both of these sides I'm talking about. So the 1990s and newer, those have typically been on a little bit more valuable dirt. Uh, half an acre, acre, acre and a half. So a little bit bigger track, uh, path of progress. So the dirt has some appreciation in it. I call those my lotto tickets that I'm going to rent the home until a builder comes and says, hey, I want that dirt. And I said, good, I want a big check. But those, we're renting those uh, $1,600 to $2,000 and we're buying them uh all in, you know, the repairs, closing costs, purchase price from about 120000 to 175000 So it's still pretty good numbers, not as good a return on investment, but a little bit more dollars per month coming in. And we have some appreciation that's more likely there. Mm -hmm. And so how do you go about finding those deals? I mean, I'm assuming you're not stocking the mobile home parks of Central Florida every weekend, or are you? <laughs> you know, we can find them the same way anyone finds any deal. If you do letters, if you do signs on the side of the road, if you do online, Google AdWords, Facebook, uh, if you put signs, I think I said signs on the side of the road, MLS, uh, Zillow, like all of those can work. You just change your marketing from house to mobile home. It, it sounds pretty simple, but back to the communication. If we tell people what we really want, they can bring it to us. But for me, I find most of my deals through networking. I tell everyone what I want to buy over and over and over again. In my area, people will even fill in the blank. They'll say, Adrian, we know you buy mobile homes. When I'm at home, I'm always in a neon yellow shirt and it says, my wife buys mobile homes. I am not seen in public without that shirt on because there could be a chance someone there needs to sell their mobile home. Other investors haven't wanted to learn them, so they bring me deals. 
They said, oh, there's no value in this. Adrian, do you just want to help this person out? Of course I will. Realtors, same thing. Realtors get paid based on the closing cost, or sorry, closing price. Mobile homes typically have one less zero on the price, so they're going to do the same amount of work for less money. Not really. Realtors want to help people. So that I became an information source to realtors, help them out as much as they want. And every once in a while, they're like, Adrian, will you just buy this home? I don't have time to deal with it. Of course I can. So networking is my personality, and that is how I find most of my deals. Cool. Yeah. So it's uh it's uh it's interesting and I like I love the um t-shirt idea. <laughs> Us that you know up in Canada, we're like a little bit uh how can I say a bit behind and a bit less loud maybe than a lot of like Americans might be, but I love that idea. Like it's getting me thinking, should I be walking around with a t-shirt that says I buy this kind of real estate? I don't know. <laughs> I mean it's I wouldn't say it's just there, you know. My wife doesn't love being in public with me all the time with it. She's like, Can we just not have some attention? So I do joke around that the only person can get me out of the shirt is her because I will go incognito in a gray shirt or something, you know, because the communication thing again, you know, I want her to be happy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, you got anything else you want to tell me about your business before we switch tax? I think some of the key things I just explained, even if you're not going to get in the mobile home space, is I went where most people weren't. So less competition, whatever that is, I see that changing now. That happened a few years ago in the storage space in the U.S., the mobile home park. That's why the mobile home park space is so crowded. I'm kind of seeing that in the laundromat space right now. I think it's an older mom and pop business, not brought up to the current you know, uh, technology. I'm seeing people come in, buy it, bring it up to technology, raise rents and prices, that's really what I did in the mobile home space. And it's still working. It's not massively talked about. But my question for the audience would be, what is next? Is it the washing, the laundry mats? What, what is? There's always something that is not crowded. And we just have to work way less. And then tell everyone exactly what you want. If it's not a bright yellow t-shirt, there's something that you love that you can talk about and bring that into your marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are two really great pieces of advice. Um, you know, and as I, as I was listening to you, I'm thinking, yeah, okay. That's actually kind of true. Right. Is that like whatever kind of space you're willing to go with place your place and it doesn't have to be a physical place, but like whatever kind of space you're willing to get into that other people either aren't aware of or don't want to go there. That's a perfect niche in which you're going to have very little competition and the bar is going to be low to get deals, to operate, to do whatever it is you need to do. So yeah, being willing to go where, where other people aren't. Have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another? Our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals. For me, the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind. In my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. And now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. Um, which is really a nice segue kind of into the next question. So one of my pet peeves in the real estate space is that very often people, you know, you get this kind of polished image of like where we all are today. Aren't we all, you know, 40 years old and successful and people aren't super transparent about the lifestyle hits and the sacrifices that they made to get to where like your Instagram you know, feed looks really cool. So tell me about what that looked like for you. Like what are some of those kind of, sacrifices or lifestyle hits that you took to get where you are? I love your questions. Uh, <laughs> and I, everyone realizes that these are so important business questions and life questions. I was fortunate when I got very serious in my real estate. So I was a hobby landlord, I'd say about 11 years. And then I decided, all right, I'm going to go full time in this. Uh, my wife at the time was an RN. We could live off of her income. That didn't mean we can go and travel and do a lot of that, but we could live off of hers. And I could snowball my real estate business over and over and over to grow faster. So that was a very fortunate space we were in. Going back, I would say I would have gone and grown a little bit slower. Uh, I don't regret it, but we didn't 
get to uh, enjoy any of those profits of a snowball? And what happens if I would have passed away before or she would have? And we didn't get to celebrate any of those wins. And I have friends, I say that now because I have friends that did pass away early. And also, I spent a lot of hours. You know, we hear the grind. And I think that that's one thing that the social media is not good at, is the people that quote-unquote grind and work 70, 80, 100 hours, they're just banging their chest. Those are who we see. The ones that are like, no, I didn't get in this to work over 40 hours. They're quiet because they're not on social media. They're out enjoying their life. So we have a lot of that influence and I fell into that, which is one of the challenges we had is because I would be working, 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 thinking I was doing it all for us when really she just wanted to watch a movie together or do something else at like five minutes. And then three hours later, like, well, I thought we were watching a movie. Finding that balance that goes with that, that communication thing. That's one reason I said it's so important. But finding where that is, getting a, a clear vision. I'm very big on vision these days. I've, it's really helped me. Where do I want to be? Kind of the time frame. All right, this is what it's going to take to grow there. Right now, I'm growing the business much slower, partially because I, I got to a good spot, but I don't want to do the work it takes to buy 10, 12 deals a year. That's not what I want for my relationship side. If I was single, yeah, maybe I would. I'd put more effort there because I would have more time. But I don't also just I just don't think it's healthy to be all in one side, either side. You know, most entrepreneurs still they love the business side of it. So they need that growth piece of it. Going on the topic here, though, is also not comparing yourself to someone. What is the quote? Uh, don't compare compare your year one to someone's 20 year 20. There's something like that as a quote out there. And I fell into that because I got very fortunate of going to a, an old school meeting. It was at IHOP. You know, you have dinner twice a month. No one there spent more than $10 on a meal. And like that was the meeting entry fee. There was no big speak or anything. Everyone there had been investing longer than I had been alive. And they didn't need to do another deal. They were in the business because they love it. And they talked about their best deals and their worst deals. Because that's what you do whenever you're set. You know, you don't talk about the average singles. Well, I started comparing every deal to their best deals. And I passed up a lot of stuff because I'm like, well, this doesn't compare to Lenny's deal that he just talked about because he could be picky at that time. I needed a bunch of singles and maybe some doubles. And when I got that through my head, that really helped me. And that's what I go for now. And you know, I go for really good deals because I'm conservative, but I don't, I don't think I set up anything that's going to be a home run from minute one it turns into that so com the comparison thing can really rob us of our happiness and deals yeah yeah absolutely no i think you're you're i, I have nothing to add to that i think you said you said it really well <laughs> um and you know thanks for for being transparent about the you know the what the beginning process of that looked like and i think you know you're so right that like one of the other things that our industry tends to do is to glorify, like I was joke of like, you know, were you up at 4 a.m. this morning doing your affirmations, oh, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, full disclosure, I do know 4 a.m. Aff affirmations, I'm sleeping, like, <laughs> um, and I and I, I think to dispel the myth that like you have to be at that level of hustle all the time to live comfortably from real estate, like that's just it's not the case. You do need to make some sacrifices and you need to be intelligent about what you do, but it's not this, this uh, doesn't have to be this ethos of like grind all the time to the, at the expense of everything else in your life. So I completely agree. Now I am the 4am affirmation guy. Uh, I'm a Hal Elrod fan, but I do it for my, my mental happiness. And I have found if I do my miracle morning, so it's about an hour, hour and a half, it's reading, it's not business mm -hmm. stuff. It's getting my mindset right to be positive and happy in my own mind. Then the business becomes a lot easier. And I do it because I love it. And it doesn't mean I'm up every 4 a.m. And I don't post about it a ton. I probably should a little bit more just so then people realize there is a lot of hard work that I put in to my life. And I do the cold plunge and I've been doing it probably right at the beginning of the craze of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, Florida cold plunge is also way different. <laughs> but when I was doing cold showers, I was telling people that. And then I learned, you know, I have to say it's a Florida cold shower. 
because that is nothing compared to what any Canadian, probably even your hot showers are. But it is, you have to figure out, I believe, what works for you. For me, the 4 or 5 a.m. works because I'm not always very strong to be able to not look at my phone. And at that hour, nothing lights up because everyone else is asleep. So I kind of need that natural parameter. And there's just a quietness to me, energy-wise, because the world doesn't seem to be, at least in my space, hustling and bustling. And so I need that quiet time for, for myself to be able to go and do everything else. Yeah, it's a, that's like a really, I think a great point, you know, like uh, my, so like my son is currently struggling with like a little bit of attention stuff. And like one of the things they do at school is they like, either they have them like set up like kind of a, a screen around themselves or like they're allowed to like go out of the classroom to like do their work. And I think what you're alluding to is that that's a similar practice in the business space that like, you know, and God knows we have all kinds of things soliciting our attention all the time. And so how are the ways that you can like set up your little concentration bubble be it because you're awake when no other people are or you got your phone on do not disturb whatever it is but i think that's like super important in this moment when our attention is consistently being solicited by everything um last question because we're kind of running out of, running out of time um tell me um what do you think we should be talking about in our industry that we're not talking about unless you already mentioned it oh what are we not talking about you know, I, I'm i pretty concerned with the affordable housing space. Uh, most mobile homes are in it. I'm hearing a little bit more talk about the affordable housing space, but I'm concerned there because we're not adding to it. Is it sorry, we're not adding housing to it. I believe in America we're actually adding the demand of people that need it, and we're not adding so much housing. I'm starting to hear a little bit more talk about adding some housing to it. But from a pure business side, it hasn't made sense to actually add affordable housing because you can just put a little bit more money into it, have the granite in a new brand new place and you get higher rent. So from those numbers, I don't know what the real answer is. I mean, I'm, I can be a little biased and say build mobile home parks, even though that's not my exact niche, but I believe that solves the affordable housing space. But I'm a little um, skeptical on the U.S. government because they're going to say, oh, well, we don't like mobile home parks because it's been pretty much proven that they don't like it, partially because they don't get as much tax dollars on it. So, I, yeah, I'm a little anti-government uh, on a lot of things that they've been proven wrong. And I think the other thing that the U.S. government has that scares me is when we had the COVID and allowed people to not pay their rent, I think it scares me that we set an expectation that that will happen again. And I'm very big on personal responsibility, no matter what part of your life and business. And that takes away the personal responsibility of people having to pay. So I don't know what's going to happen the next recession. I hope we have one because I feel like we're, they're trying to stop one. And that's just unhealthy. I mean, it's just unhealthy in economics and not ever have a recession. And we keep propping this one, you know, this boom up. Uh, and I think it's like a rubber band. The longer we stretch it, the harder it's going to come down. If we can ha let it have some natural. So what are we doing to prepare for that is really it. Because we can't control any of that. I mean, and I mean, the U.S. is the monster of the, the world. What, what we do and what we screw up will affect you. And it will affect the whole world. Uh, so what do we do to protect our business so that we are okay? That's one reason I'm very heavy in the mobile home affordable housing rent range. So those $2,000 ones that I mentioned are not the affordable housing. I don't want a bunch of those because I want to be able to drop my rents to be able to keep people there a very long time if I need to drop them and still make money. I don't want to have to go back out and not be able to pay my rent or have, or sorry, my mortgages or have negative cash flow on properties because I'm not going to compromise my integrity again with it. That's pro That's the first thing that came to my mind. I do want to circle a tiny bit back to the last question, even though I can talk about it forever, is that everyone fails. I have not studied anyone super successful that hasn't failed. And we get caught up not wanting to fail and just seeing everyone's glamour stuff because that's what 
fake book and Instagram is all about is all the good. Well, everyone I have studied has failed. And I think the key to it is they all kind of fail forward. There's a great John Maxwell book, Failing Forward. And they get up and they actually ask for help. And I have seen that's what been my success is the more I just take some action after I know a little bit. And then I fail and I have some people to ask for help with. That has been really good for me. And almost everyone I've seen has been super successful or grown pretty quick. That's their strategy. They know they're going to fail and they have people to help them out. Thank you. I, uh, that, that, anyways, I just think you've shared a lot of like very valuable stuff. I find you're, um, find you're like, you're, you're quite wise, um, <laughs> for, for some of the stuff you're saying, I think, and I think you're absolutely spot on. I think, uh, you know, definitely the U S um, why do we have American guests on the show, even though it's a Canadian show, because, uh, we're the tail of a larger dog and it's the North American economy. So whatever's going on South of the border, like directly affects us. Um, in addition to people, you know, maybe having some interest to invest there, but I think, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of, and I just want to kind of, you know, go back to the, the, the personal responsibility thing. Um, I'm also like a real big fan of, of personal responsibility. I also, um, think that, you know, in terms of like, like in our market, we're extremely heavily rent controlled. Okay. And so, um, like we think New York and California and like, like Quebec, which is my part of Canada is like left, left, left of those places. Right. Um, and so then you get into what to me is, is a bit the moral hazard, which is, you know, one person uh, like you, because you're taking away the negative consequences associated with something and putting it onto someone else. That's the definition of the moral hazard, right? Is that like, if, if one person makes the damages and someone else pays the bill, well, what, in what incentive do you have to not make the damages? And that like the extent to which our society creates these moral hazards, like it's, it's really, it's dangerous. And like the fact mm -hmm. that like, yes, we do need to have mechanisms to help out people who are struggling but when it turns into moral hazards that encourage, um, you know, behaviors that hurt all of us, it's, it's not helpful. Um, so I think you're, I think you're pointing at something yeah. very true. I, I totally agree. The other part of that, and I mean, you complimenting me saying I'm so wise. I think one reason I'm so wise is I've made a lot of mistakes and learned from them. I, I've gotten the most growth in my pain, my pain of mad, bad decisions and we are robbing those people of their growth when we don't let them go through that pain. It's hard to go through the pain. We don't want to see anyone suffer, but there is some good that comes from it if we utilize it the right way. I was fortunate to learn to utilize it the right way most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Adrian, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I've really enjoyed it. Um, where can our audience catch up with you if they want to connect, learn more? The best place to uh, find me is on my website. And I have a free download there for debunking even more mobile home myths. If you go to lifestyle-rei.com slash real estate investor club podcast, and I'm sure you're going to put it in the show notes there uh, you can download that for free shoot me a message there i'm on uh, linkedin instagram and facebook i had to think about it a little bit because i'm really active on facebook the other ones i'm there because i know i need to be there all right well adrian thank you so much and have a thank great you. week